Today is Monday, March the 28th, 2022. We're at 1236 East Washington Street here in Newcastle, PA at the Rashid Rugs um, store. And we are here to talk about the history of the Rashid family and Rashid Oriental Rugs. Um, we are interviewing Jerome Joseph Rashid, known as Jerry, right? And um, his wife Sylvia is here with us as well. So this interview is being done for the Lawrence County Historical Society. So thank you to the Rashids for taking the time to do this today. Um, and we're just really interested in capturing the history of your family and the store and um, making sure that Newcastle doesn't forget what's been here. So that's important. So why don't we start out with Tell us a bit about your family coming to the, the Rashids coming to the United States. Okay, uh, <clears throat> they came in 1896 and they had to run away uh, or else they'd be captured and used as slave soldiers. All right, so that was what happened and they started. And there was four of them, four, four brothers, I think four they brothers, were brothers that came and my grandfather on my dad's side was one of the first four. And supposedly, they said later on, they were split up, of course. My dad's father and his one brother peddled around, even here in Newcastle and Sharon and all around the area. They did peddling, they would knock at doors. Uh, what can we do for you? Can we help you? We can fix this, we can fix that. And so it must have started to get into rugs for whatever. They must have had a little background, I'm not sure. But anyhow, they started peddling rugs. They sold linens, handkerchiefs, brassware, different things. It was all that stuff, anything they could get and sell, and that's what they did. And uh, so they peddled all around all these Franklin Oil City, Meadville, all the cities around this area, maybe a 100 mile radius. Uh, you know, so uh, they did that, which was mm, started in the first store started in uh, Lake Chautauqua, New York. My dad and his brother were working together. And my dad, well, first, my dad grew up working in that store in the summers. He was going to school, grade school and everything else, but in the summers he would come there and work. All right, for them, and uh, he would do uh, odds and ends with the rug cleaning business and selling rugs and everything for his uncle, my dad's brother, who was his uncle. My dad's uh, got out. Of, my dad's father got out of the business, but my dad continued to work for his uncle. I'm sorry. So uh, that was when when he was in grade school started. Every summer he would go and help. And he befriended uh, Thomas Edison and his wife, okay? And they would use him to run to the store. Sammy, Sammy, they would call him, would you go to the store for us? Would you buy eggs, bread, whatever they needed? You know, he would do that. So that was amazing, Thomas Edison. Yeah, so that was a proud thing from our father. Now his family was living where? His parents. They were by then they were probably in South Dakota, Lemon, South Dakota. Mm -hmm. And that's where he, he grew up on a sod ranch, a uh, sod house. You know, he they raised sheep and cattle and different things. And uh, they were sheep ranchers, really. Your grandmother, your dad's mother also come over from Lebanon? Later. They sent for them, you know. Uh, I'm not sure when they came, but on my mother's side, my mother was a Rashid also. They might have been fifth cousins, but I, I think I come from like four or five Rashid families. All, I mean, how many? It goes back. Rashids married Rashids then. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. But anyhow, uh, they, my grandfather on my mother's side mm -hmm. came later, all right? And he, came because he had to run away also, 
already had to run away from the slavery thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after six years, he, he came to Newcastle and established here. For some reason he came here. But he sent for his wife, who came with a six-year-old child, with my mother. He never saw her until she was six years old. He left when my grandmother was pregnant with her. And so that was, uh, that was something. Both, both sides came over. Yes. But my grandfather on my mother's side opened a tailor shop in downtown Newcastle, across from the post office, which was the library on North Street. His shop was there. He did cleaning, which he would send out, and they would bring it back. And he did the pressing and the tailoring and repairs. And he would take things home at night on the bus. And my grandmother lived up here on the east side. And she would do repairs also. So that's your, that's my, your mother's side yes. lived up here? Yes. Mm -hmm. OK. Right. OK, so he was working for, for his uncle. How did he end up here? Well, the Depression hit. And he was working for his uncle. And everyone was after his uncle because he owed money. It was a tough time. And uh, my dad couldn't stand the pressure of everybody hounding him for money and money. And so, of course, he was courting my mother, who lived in Newcastle. So he knew of her from years ahead of courting her, probably met her when she was 13. And so they courted for a few years, whatever. And uh, so that's why he came to Newcastle. He left and came to Newcastle, opened up his own. But his SM was here, I understand, you know, from articles I've read. Father afford to open a, a store in that time in the Depression? I don't know, but uh, he was a survivor, I guess. You know, we ran across canceled checks just the other day uh, that he would send home to Detroit. They were in Detroit. His family lived in Detroit, and he would send $25 checks, $10 checks to his dad and to his brother, who was going to law school, became a judge. So your father came here and started his business. Um, where was his business? Where was his business? Where did he open up first? The first stores, I don't know. There was East Washington Street. Uh, Mercer Street, then the Shantic Avenue is what I remember. All right, uh, yeah, 320 in the Shantic Avenue. He rented from Al Barletto, who owned the Clawson Company. Okay. So you remember you remember the store on on the Shantic? Yes. So that that was the, the most. Yeah. Important. And and why did he why did he move out of that location? We were moved out. Redevelopment bought the whole block. That was in the late 60s. They were buying everything up, all right? And so we had no choice. They bought that building. We were renting. We got put out, basically. And so they relocated us for a year next to the uh, the big bank, Lawrence Saving, Saving and Trust. There was an auto store right next to it on the first floor on East Washington Street, and it was empty. So we were able to go in there for a year or two and uh, while we were able to purchase this property it was something we could afford that's why we're on the east side at the time it was more reasonable than going up to the north hill or wherever we wanted to stay downtown but they told us we could buy a piece of land down there and build so that was good but it turned out you had to buy a whole block and develop it and so we couldn't do that so we bought this piece of property up here on the east side, and we built a building. We got a loan. Uh, it was first federal then. Mr. Clark was the president, all right? And he, we went in for a loan. We went into one bank for a loan, and they turned us down. Went into a, I went to see him, and he said he would give us the money because of our name. <laughs> that was it. We didn't qualify, but he knew my father. He said, I'll lend you the money because of your name. We built the building. Now we needed the same thing for inventory. They turned us down again, the banks. He went to see Mr. Clark, gave us the money for inventory. So we had to move our account and different things. So that's what we did. And, 
it all worked out. And is that this building or is this building? That's part of this building. As you see this bulkhead up here above me, I'm sitting, that was, that was the building we built. From there all the way back, okay. it was 40 by 80, all right? And it served us well until 97. My father had passed by then. And uh, so I bought the property next door, held on to it for a while, <coughs> added on. We took a loan out, built it, and all the way back and made a much bigger building and it served us well up to now. We had floods. <laughs> the water came in from the Nishanik yeah, over that big, the curb was two and a half foot high at Nishanik Avenue, whatever, two feet. And the water was over that and going into the front door. Did it, did it damage a lot of your inventory? No, we had a, my dad, and that we would go in and there was a floor there. And then there was a stage in the back, a uh, foot, foot and a half high. That's where we washed the rugs. And we would pull them up by hand. And they, we would hang in poles up there. And uh, that's where we hang, hung all the rugs. The dry, the heater, we had one heater in the whole place. It heated the building, plus it blew on the rugs at night. And that was what dried the rugs. And uh, I can remember going down in hip boots with my father. The river was flooding and the water was a foot over the front door. And, and he panicked and opened the door and all the water ran in. It was, it was keeping it out, most of it. But he had made holes in the floor into the basement and the water would rush into those holes and there was nothing down there. So So what what besides rugs did your father sell? Does he do things too? As far as I can remember, he had linens, women's beautiful uh, handkerchiefs. Mm -hmm. uh, he sold when I was getting in here when I went as a young kid, he was about done. He sold a lot of brassware, things that were, you know, like that. Uh, pottery stuff, things that were, Did he you not know. have fabric also? Oh, well, he did, he did have fabric. We still have fabric from that time. <laughs> but like the brass and things like that, did he buy that from overseas? He would buy them from probably out of New York City, who knows where. Mm -hmm. some, something, if he could buy it, if he could afford it, or they would lend him the, give him the, you know, the hardware, and he would be able to sell it and pay them bills. But growing up, I remember they were always after money from my father, too. Struggled, struggled, struggled. When did he, did he always do the, the washing and repair of rugs, or was that something he got into later? That's what I remember, always. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife would come there as a young girl with her brother who worked for my dad, and he would bring her down. It was uh, Joe Del Signor, mm -hmm. who lay, and uh, he would be out in the garden with this, suit and tie and hat but his hat he would walk downtown the town was booming wherever he would go and uh, any young lady that came his way he would stop and tip his hat he was just he was just a gentleman as could be now your father wasn't just a businessman your father was a community person oh yes tell us everything about that. Both everything well i had a handicapped mother. brother all right cerebral palsy and uh, so her and my mother got into uh, crippled children, you know, Easter Seal, all that. They found it. They were one of the founders. And uh, yeah, they got into that. Then the PTA, my mother started the PTAs, different ones. She started Franklin, uh, Rose Avenue, all those PTAs. My mother was in all those things along with him, different thing. The Lions Club, he had 45 years of perfect attendance. But that, he had more years in it than that, you know, but it's just amazing. You could make up meetings at those days. You could, uh, you know, if you missed a Tuesday lunchtime meeting, he, he collected them. He was ahead. He had more in the bank. <laughs> he would go to Beaver Falls at night or some other city. Always, yeah. And he spoke about rugs a lot, too, didn't he? Yeah, he did, yeah. Oh, yeah, he was called to you know, the Rotary Club, all these places, they all called him to speak, a lot of things, a lot of lady auxiliaries and things. He spoke a lot. And he was very involved with the church? Churches, yes. Tell us, very tell us involved. About, yeah, they were both. The church and the carpet. The carpet. Uh, when they built the new St. Joseph Church back in 1961, uh, 60 it started, you know, and uh, 
we were good friends with the priest, Father Worley, of course. They were so involved in church. And my dad designed a carpet that matched the stained glass windows. St. Joseph Church is full of beautiful stained glass windows, beautiful. And so he designed a carpet that matched the windows. And the sun would come in those windows. It was gorgeous, beautiful. And uh, so they ordered the carpet. And it, while it was on order, they changed the plans of the church. So there was more carpet than needed. So my father never said a word. Rolled it up, put it in the back, and we stored it. Never said a word. I charged him accordingly to what he sold, kept the carpet. Now, through the years, the carpet started getting older. Uh, probably in the 80s, the doorways were wearing, whatever. And so we had carpet to fix it, to repair it. So where did that come from? They wanted to know. Well, we had it to fix the spots, the doorways and whatever, wherever needed. So they did that. And uh, then back in about that was later. 90s, 90s, I believe. 90s they, had, they had to replace the whole carpet. And they wanted to put down just red plain carpet. I said, no, you can't do that. You can't pick this carpet up. It's, 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 a, it's a landmark for this church. I said, how about if we make you new carpet? So we made him new carpet, we got good prices, and we, I had it made exactly the same. Exactly the same. And we installed it with new installers. If I could maybe go back a minute, when we installed the original carpet, my dad's brother I talked about, the one that was a year younger, had a big carpet department in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Big store. And he sent his main man that did the installing to come to Newcastle. He stayed in the New Penn Hotel down there. All right, and uh, at night I would help him or whatever and install that carpet. So we did that. That was the first carpet. The second carpet, I had my installers do it and uh, put it in. But And I helped on both of those jobs. So your father was very involved in the church, for sure. Yeah. Now, let's back up your mother in doing all these things. She was honored in 1964. First Lady of Newcastle. Mm -hmm. For all the work that she did. Hello. <laughs> a, lot of a lot of community work. Right. Active at St. Francis yeah. Hospital. Yeah, she was involved in all the PTAs uh, because uh, I had a great growing up childhood. It was wonderful. I told you we went to the, out to the stream fishing and we'd swim in the summer, ice skate in the winter out there. There were ponds. And uh, we just, close to Rose Avenue School, we had the ball field and the playground, and we played ball at every season it was, basketball, baseball, whatever, football, we played that. We played that till we were out of high school. The kids still played, and we had a wonderful time. As a child, we played, I can remember one of the things, playing Cowboys and Indians. We loved that. In the backyards, through everybody's backyard. It was so, just great to grow up here. And my parents weren't the type of parents that made me work all the time. I was, you know, allowed to go out and play and have a good time. And I had a great life growing up. And what about, what about your family? Because you must have had a pretty large family here. In, in Newcastle? Newcastle? Yeah, we did. Uh, my mother's side was big. My dad's side was not. He was the only one mm -hmm. on his side. He had, he had eight siblings. And uh, my grandmother here had five or six. She lost a couple uh, from before that. And so, uh, and they were all around. Every Sunday at my grandmother's house, right up the street, she would cook. And uh, every Sunday she would be cooking. We would go after church. And uh, it was a wonderful thing. My sister and my mom and me would stop after church and go in for breakfast. My grandmother would have breakfast for us. Traditional Lebanese food? A lot of it was, yeah, for Sundays, oh yeah. She would make uh, kibbe. You know, the kibbe is the ground. But she would be mixing it as you walk in her back door. She had a big bowl of it and mixing it. And she would go like this with her hand, and you better open up, because she was going to get a mouthful of it. Just as fresh, raw, 
and she's making it and she pop it right in your mouth and so that's how you learn to like kibbe as a young kid you didn't like it so much until she kind of forced us to love it and uh yeah all those things and uh the adults would go in the dining room and the kids would go into the kitchen where she had a table for us to sit and eat so we would eat in separate places because there wasn't enough room he had a living room dining room two bedrooms one bath upstairs that was it and she would have and she raised two of her niece and nephews uh, Claude and Claudette Claudette, um, they would stay there and live there so she had uh, four and two six six kids and a husband and wife in a two-bedroom house and where was that up on East Washington Street right across from the little old library there and uh, yeah it was something uh, you went to high school here in in Newcastle yeah um, and off to the army from there or what did you No, Newcastle High School uh, college and working you know and it, it got to where I had to almost quit going to college <coughs> help my dad because he couldn't get anybody good to work so you know and so I, I went into business with him that's what I started yeah you were working here for your father? Yes. And well, the Vietnam War came. Okay. Okay, and so I was going to be drafted. So we looked at, in the, my friend and I lived next door. We looked into the National Guard. It was six years, six months, and meetings every weekend. Either that or you go away for two years. So I didn't want to leave my parents, my brother, my dad. So I joined the National Guard. So we were six months active duty, six years meetings every weekend. So that was in 63. And you served, you, you went in training where, you said? Fort Knox, Kentucky. Then I went to uh, communications and they, they shipped me to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. A big army, big army fort down there. When, so backing up a little bit when did you start working with your father and how did he introduce you to the business I, I, I was nine years old and my father would take me to work because he wanted to relieve my mother of, of me being there she had my handicapped brother so he would take me to work and set me down on a table and he would repair rugs you know so he would sit there and repair and I would have to watch him I didn't have to watch him but that's what he wanted me to do and he showed me and taught me and then I'd get bored and I'd go and play on the rugs and hide on the rugs, I'd disappear. But that's, uh, that's what it was, just growing up in that business, through high school, after school, when I was going to school, after school. Yep, I can remember going with him at nights to see for him and uh, yeah, that was, just was a way of life. And it became part of me, I just, Got into it, and you know, when we took over the new store, you know, I loved it. My mother didn't want me to do it because she saw how he struggled, but it worked out for me. Now you had, uh, you have customers all over the place. All over, out of the country even. There was a rug that um, had to go to New York City. What was the story with that rug? Oh, okay. That was, what was the reason? 9-11. Okay, I had a rug that the New York City guy was from Sharon, his mother Sharon. She's still a customer. And his grandmother. They're still my customers from Sharon. All right. And he's in New York City. He lives there. He has jobs there. And he found this rug or bought this rug, an old, old rug that needed a lot of tender, loving care repairs. All right. And so he knew of us because of his mother, grandmother, sister, whatever. But he sent this rug to us or brought it here. I can't remember. But anyhow, we acquired it. And we spent maybe six months repairing it and getting it in good shape. And we finally shipped it out to him. That was the morning. UPS picked it up the morning of 9-11. And I panicked. And I called UPS. I said, you just picked up a rug here. 
This must have been about 1 o'clock in the afternoon that I called the UPS. I said, you just bought, they bombed New York, you know, the World Trade Center. I said, can I get that rug back? Please bring it back. They said, okay, we'll get it back to you. Well, it was already gone. They called me and said, it went out. We shipped it already. I said, what am I going to do with this? We can't have this rug. It has to be delivered in downtown New York City. And they said, don't worry. They called me the next day. They said, it's in a warehouse. We put it in a warehouse. It's safe. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. We promise you. Because I was on the phone constantly. Anyhow, they called me the next day. They said, UPS up in New York City walked it in. Two men carried it. It was a 9 by 12 rug, but it was old and thin. It wasn't probably that heavy, but they delivered it by foot. They carried it in, and I had to carry it up, I think, I don't know how many floors, nine floors up. He lived in an apartment building somewhere. The power was off, and they delivered it, UPS. So they did a good job on that. He still has it to this day. He just called me recently about how much he loves that rug. About a week ago, huh? Hmm? About a week ago. Something like that, huh? A little bit of information about rugs in general, oriental rugs. Okay. Uh, People say, what is an oriental rug? To be an oriental rug, it must be hand knotted. It's not that it's made in the Orient, China, wherever. Middle East countries all make hand knotted rugs. India, Pakistan, China, uh, Afghanistan, Iran, all those places. And so they all make hand knotted rugs and a lot of them are similar. They have this certain designs from depending where they are and whatever, and they change the designs and the knotting. But uh, to make a hand knotted rug, it's quite extensive. You know, you have to have the cotton, which is the foundation, it's the loom. So they have to grow it, pick it, spin it, wash it, string the loom, make a loom. Now the wool, they have to raise the sheep, shear the sheep, spin the wool, wash the wool, dye the wool. Sometimes they'll dye seven times the colors to get it right. So now they have that all ready to go. They need a pattern. So someone makes a pattern. So they do that. Now they'll sit beside each other on a bench and they start tying knots around the cords. All right. And when they tie a knot on a cord, pull it tight, cut it off, go to the next one, change color. That's what makes the design going straight across. They don't put in a pattern. They go straight across. Then they put in another weft thread like that across, pound it down twi twice, two of them they put down. Then they put another row of knots. So that's continue, continue, continue. A big rug could take two years to make. It could take a lifetime to make are, a rug. Are you able to get rugs from Iran or are those still? Yeah, you can still get them, but they come in through importers. The importers bring them in and this and that. Personally, I like the... Uh, good quality India and Pakistan because of the dyes they don't bleed and run the old 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 Persian rugs Iran that's Persia they hold up pretty good but some of the new ones the colors bleed and run and so we worry about that a lot okay. you, you hear about a, a Caucasian rugs that's geometric basically uh, and it's you know it's different than the uh, they have Geometric design, the Caucasian, yeah, those designs, you have the floral designs, which are from uh, all countries make everything anymore, so. Now, your father inherited a, a beautiful Caucasian rug. That was a, yeah, that was from a special friend of his who was an attorney that he did business with early on in his career, my father, when he moved to Newcastle. And I suppose I can mention the name, right? Yeah, that was attorney Fred Fruit. That my dad sold many rugs to him. And that was a special rug that my dad sold him. And when Mr. Fred Fruit died, he left that in his will from my father. And that was quite a rug, and we still have that to this day. And that's a, a, a tribal prayer rug. Yes, well, it's, it's a little bigger than a prayer rug. It looks like that, but it's almost a mosque rug. It's prayer rug is a small rug that they can carry with them, put down and pray on it. This rug points one way, like a prayer rug would, but it could be a, a moss rug or a little bigger than a prayer rug. This is Bob Elliott. He's uh, been an employee of ours for 48 years. 
And I'm going to back up a little bit about <laughs> 49 years. <laughs> I don't know. But we had an ad in the paper. We had to hire someone, my father and I. And uh, so Bob applied and came into the store. We had an interview. And he sat in our, we had a half a little office then. And he came in and he sat there. He was a former basketball player of Shenango High School. He was a star player. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, he came here for, for an interview, and he sat there, and we started talking to him and asking him questions, and he had long hair, all right, it was down to here. And my father and I can't remember the questions, but we asked him questions, yeah. and he was just kind of shy, and he sat there like this, <laughs> and he, he couldn't look up at us, and anyhow, we talked to him, asked him questions, and, and he left. The interview was over, and my dad and I looked, and we both shook our heads. Mm. He's the one. So we hired Bob 48 years, 49 years ago. And he's still here. He's still here. He's still, he <laughs> but he's just recently retired, yeah. but he comes in one day a week or so, helps me out when I need help. He's been the backbone of this business. Mm -hmm. Washed our rugs. Uh, Everything. We've got it all. So that's, that's a tough business, right? Tell us about, so, I mean, we see the lovely sales room and everything else, but what goes on behind those doors? What do you, Well, we, we do the washing, Oriental washing, all these years. And Bob is ahead of that, and he's done it, and he's been perfect for me. He does repairs. Uh, in fact, he's repairing a rug that belongs to you. Right now, he's yeah, I actually on it. was working on that. Yes. Right now, he's working on it. Yeah. Uh, and so, so, when you wash rugs, what kinds of things do you have to to be careful of, or what what did okay. you have to learn? Well, well, many things. Uh, start with my dad teaching us first. Of course, yeah. Um, our type of cleaning involves a lot of uh, physical labor. Um, we use a lot of soap and water. You got to be careful with the dyes. Many things you learn about the different rugs that um, some of the rugs, the, the colors could be fugitive. Um, uh, we would do the repairs. Um, just well, jet. Go, go ahead. ahead. But the way, the way we wash rugs, we've developed our own system, and through the years we've changed a little bit from my father's way. Yeah. And we've developed things, and Bob's developed things, and it's. It's something that takes us three days. Yeah. The process, because one day we wash the rugs, and we rinse them and rinse them and rinse them, right, Bob? Yes. And then the second day, you can go on and tell about that. Yeah, the second day we go we go in and we have to um, work on them some more. Some of the fringe work we have to work on. Yeah, they turn, they turn, they, they, they oxidize they, overnight. Yes. The front, so we have to redo all the fringes sometimes. Yes. And then we have the heat back on again, and then the third day, uh, for the most part, the rugs are mostly dry, and uh, so we start taking them down. So we, we have heat and fans well, in there. Let's back up. So you've got you've got a big machine in the back that looks like a a roller. What is that? Flush, flusher and ringer. It's a flusher and ringer. It's a, like the old washing machines and the small rollers. Mm -hmm. This is a giant one that we put the rugs through. It rinses them and rings them. Yeah, that's a final rinse. And how old is that machine? <laughs> how old, Eric? That was antique when we built the store in 72. If I'm not mistaken, it was at least 40 years old then. And we've had it redone. We, we do maintenance on it. We watch it. It does well for us. But it's over now. We had to quit. Yeah. And, and how do you dry them? We have heat and fans in this dry room. There's poles that come down from the ceiling 20-some feet up. And they come down, each rug hangs in front of the fans and heat. Put a 100 degree temperature in there for yeah, two we've, or three days. We've washed rugs that, well, we had one 30 feet long in there, I think. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. So we've had 20. 35, it was 38, that one from a switch. Oh yes, that's right. It was. So all, all different sizes. We have that whole room filled. We'd have it all, every pole. And just all various sizes, and other rugs as well. I mean, uh, braided rugs, machine-made rugs, all different types of area rugs. Very heavy. When they're wet, those big ones, 
it has to take a little bit of knowledge how to move them, how to handle them, how to put them on the poles to go up. A lot, a lot of work. Because you pretty much, for washing them, you kind of have a big cement floor. Well, our floor has a little curb around it, and we hose them down. Yes. We do all that. Yeah. Yeah, we would have to hose them down. Then we take, we have a squeegee, and we scrape them out, like push the water out. And we would do that how many times? Several times. Four yeah, or five times? Four or five times. Then you have to wash the backs of the rugs. You have to hand wash the fringes. And you're doing that down on your hands and knees. On your hands and knees. That's, oh, yeah. Remember I had the knee pad the, the other knee day? Pads, yeah. Well, I wasn't washing. I was making pads in, but I'm still crawling around. So. <laughs> still alive. But there's automation, you know, today and motorized machines and whatever, but it doesn't even come close to how we do it. They can't compare. No. They can't compare with our results. No, they can't. No, no cleaner in the country can compare with us. He's the best there is in the country. The best. <laughs> we don't get complaints anyhow, don't we? Right, Jerry? Mm. Never. No. Hard to give knowledge. Well, you know it's old, you know it's an antique, you know it's good, and then you're not sure where it's from all the time. Yeah. Right. And that goes for us, too. We're not, you know, <clears throat> we come in late. My father was... Yeah. Oh. Real pro. He knew it all. And the books he had. Huh? And all those books he had. Yeah. Oh, he used to in. ask, he used to quiz me on rug. We used to, rug would come in and he'd say, where's that from? And I'd say, Saruk. And then he'd get all pleased if I knew, you know, Kashan <laughs> or Harris. It would just get him happy, you know, excited. Mm -hmm. But he would do that. So you yeah. learned on the job. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. You learned, yeah. Uh, we have... We have followed in his footsteps, you know, we just know. Probably nobody around knows what we know. There are some people that study rugs. We probably didn't overstudy the rugs. We have on the hand, you know, on job training. Yeah. You never had a rug just fall well, apart every, on we you? We try to you show had, you had everybody, one. huh? You had one rug fall apart on you. Who was that? The one that you kept as a... Oh, that was a machine-made tufted rug. Oh, that thing, yeah. Yeah, it didn't fall apart. The colors streaked or something. We yeah. warned them about those rugs. They're those, those glued together. And uh, those were cheaply made, so they look pretty when they're new, but uh, they're yeah. not made very well. So, so you sell them, you wash them, and you repair them. What kinds of repairs? What do you What do you do when you repair a rug? Well, if it has fringes, or go ahead, Bob. You no, have that, that's okay. It's uh, most of the time it's either the fringes or the edges. Um, sometimes, like like your rug, it's very old and it has uh, some weak areas and some breaks, and we can mend that. We can weave them, weave the yarn back in. But for the the most part, most of it is the uh, the fringes start to fray, the rug starts to unravel. So we mend that. We have different, various ways of doing it. Um, we used to add fringes years ago. Um, now we more or less try to save the foundation of the rug and repair the existing fringe and leave it as original as possible. And uh, the same with the edges. Mm -hmm. And it, it's mostly to keep them intact so they don't keep, people don't notice sometimes, uh, right, Jerry, how the rugs are starting to come street apart. Yeah, Maybe yeah, the it corner is there, will uh, just be and, uh, partly missing. The vacuum. He was, yeah. The vacuum with the beater bar brushes and town. people just catch the fringes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. the fringes where the Cancer Society sits. Yeah, we, uh, <laughs> Highland Avenue. They're tearing it down at this moment, he said. The wrecking ball is there. And you know that place we went through it, it's full of mantles. And the wrecking ball's there, he said. If you want to get one of those fireplaces or mantle, go down and get one. Well, I went down. I was going through town, I think, in the van, and I had a big screwdriver in there, and I went in. I went in the back door, and I tore these mantles out of there by hand with the screwdriver. Put them in the back of the truck. Brought them back to work, separated them in boxes. They were in pieces, mind you, pieces. I broke some of them. I couldn't help it. But anyhow, they sat. I've kept them f until 97 when we added on. And the office needed one, and this big wall needed one. And so it was the perfect place for them. 
should know about an oriental rug, what would it be? The care of it, or the love of it, or the history? The, the rug itself, or washing it? Care, the rug itself, what would you want people to know about orientals? Okay, well, they're, they're very durable, first of all. They're mo most of them are made out of wool. So you want to be careful of your vacuum. You vacuum it, you know, Consumer Report and all these things, they advertise this best vacuum. But it's probably got the hardest, biggest brush that just eats your rug. If you ever look in a bag or canister of these upright vacuums, it's dirty rug. So you get the brush up, get it up. Don't let it dig and dig and dig. And sometimes they'll go slow and they let it dig. They think it's, it's getting the dog hairs out, the cat hairs, those things. That's the hardest thing. And so that's why they vacuum so much, to get them out. But we always say, get the brush up. Air suction's the best. That's what we say. Yeah, I, yeah, I would say they're, uh, well, like we've always said, they're works of art on the floor. And your father used to always say that, like paintings on the floor. And um, we have them, he has quite a few, I have quite a few. I have some on the wall, even. I was going to say, I mean, a lot of, you know, what, when do you put a rug on the wall as opposed to the floor? Well, you like the rug. It's yeah. a, it's a, it looks like a painting, and it might have a design that you like. And if it's a, a two by three size, four by six, whatever, mm -hmm. I've hung big ones up, you know, but they, they look wonderful. Put a rod in. Some people put decorative rods, but we use a rod you don't see. You just you see the rug itself, mostly. He found uh, two rugs for me. You remember this? I don't know if you do. The, the column rugs. Column rugs. They were they're about a foot wide. Well, we had other ones, but we not many. Maybe by four six five, foot, four foot. Oh, you know, maybe four feet, five feet. And I had two areas where I wanted to hang them. So he went and he found them on one of his buying trips, and he brought them back, and I have them hanging. And uh, I just love them. Uh, people will see them and think, you know, they don't understand. But when you explain to them, just like customers that come in, we explain to them how they're made. And Jerry will take them over and show them the loom, and uh, they they really start to get an appreciation of what they are. See, so then we go through that, and then and by the time after they buy a few rugs, they become almost addicted to them, and then they start you know you run out of floor space, and then you start putting them on the walls. <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. Yeah, yeah. our yeah. good customer in Butler, he. He has got addicted to these rugs for the last two, three years. Oh, he yeah. Just, he, he's, he's buying rugs, and he got them on his walls, a lot of them on his walls, mm -hmm. all over. That's right. Okay. What else am I not thinking about in, in, the, in the way of the store operations or the, the work you do that, that you want to make sure people remember? Remember what the store is about? About the, about the store, yeah. Our honesty yeah. is a can't touch us. Uh, our concern for the customer being happy. Uh, we would take a lot of pride in what we did. Yeah. And we would we would be very we want them to be very happy. And um, a lot of times we wouldn't. I don't think we would charge enough because we would just uh, we could never quite. We do so much above and beyond. Yeah, we do above and beyond. This morning we laid a big rug and another one up at our home in Hermitage, him and I, and, and we just we just spend as much time as possible to make them happy. Yeah. And we get the rug perfect, and it has to be. And uh, we do a lot of free labor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've always done that. Make satisfy a customer. You can't beat it. It's the best advertisement going. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And your father passed away when? Eighty. He was. He was. He was eighty-six. He passed away in eighty-eight. Okay. And your mom was before. She after was seventy after? some. Seventy some, and she went a few years later. Seventy. Uh, Eighty. Ninety-two. Yeah, I think it was in the nineties. Seventy nineties, early nineties. Yeah. Okay. It's a. It's a beautiful story. Thank you for your years of, of service to this community. 
Well, we were glad to do it. I feel bad. It's bittersweet for me. Well, you put a lot of beauty out there, so thank you. Anything I've missed or anything else? I hope we serve the community and country well. So thank you. Nice ride. <laughs> well, thank you, Bob, for keeping them going and all your service to the 